This is a boat on an ocean. Can anyone see where the ocean ends and the sky begins? You actually can't. The reason for that is because of haze produced by a local oil processing facility that's producing a fuel that we use to power our electricity for the fuel that stays in this country. This haze drifts over the lungs of the world. The ocean itself produces between 50 and 75% of the world's oxygen and absorbs 25% of the world's carbon dioxide. For the energy that ends in a power station, and it probably doesn't end in this one because this one's now closed, that powers 80% of our electricity. Most of our electricity comes from centralised generators, such as this one behind me. And although it's provided reliable electricity for us for over 100 years, in fact, it was invented the same year as the jukebox, this delivery method for energy has undergone a rapid disruption of late. And just like the jukebox, is likely to be completely disrupted. So tonight, let me take you on a journey through the energy market. Let me describe to you how your energy is produced, where it comes from, and using new disruptive digital technologies, how you can interact with the innovation and make the market work for you. Emerging economies are probably a great place to start. You know, it's hard to believe this in the cities, but 16% of the world's population actually have no access to electricity. That's 1.2 billion people on this planet that a centralised service model for electricity has failed. In fact, just under half of the world's population, while they might have access to electricity for lighting and things like that, for charging digital devices, they don't have access to electricity for cooking. So what they're doing is they're burning coal and wood. This accounts for some of the greatest amounts of emissions that humankind produce. Certainly an emission that is easily preventable. And this is the centralised system. Granted, it does provide us reliable, secure electricity. However, it comes at a cost of inefficient service delivery. So for instance, there's a lot of electricity that's lost in transmission and distribution. It's carbon intensive, it's expensive. You know, when you pay your energy bill, a significant portion of that payment that you make actually pays off the infrastructure it took to get that electricity to your house. The price of electricity is only a tiny fraction of the bill. And ultimately this system, it's geared upon the premise that you'll continue to use more and more electricity. If we're getting energy from a dirty fossil fuel intensive generation process, Shouldn't we be looking at reducing our energy consumption? Well, the centralised model doesn't support that idea. And on a grander scale, we're dealing with climate change. Most nations in the world have committed to reducing emissions. We do this because there are likely to be drastic effects that will change the Earth as we know it. These effects are man-made and they're caused by emissions. 30% of our total emissions come from generating electricity. And we owe it not only to current generations, but to future generations to change this practice. We can all make a difference in this space. So what we're starting to see in the electricity market is a phenomenon we've actually seen before. We're seeing a movement from a centralised hub and spoke type model to a completely decentralised model. We have one in four households Australia wide that have solar PV. That's 25% of Australians generating electricity behind the meter. People aren't doing this for lofty ideological reasons, although some certainly are. The reason people are putting solar PV on their rooftop, becoming their own generators, is because of the high price of electricity to receive that energy through the market itself. It's actually cheaper to have a generator located on your roof than it is to be buying energy that's generated thousands of kilometers away, transmitted over a mountain, distributed across a plateau and into the cities. And the beauty about distributed technologies is that they're opportunistic. You can deploy distributed generation anywhere there is load. Like the seagull behind me, seagulls turn up when there is an opportunity. And distributed renewable generation is no different. Wherever there is a need, these modular, prefabricated units can easily be laid down to meet local demand. They can meet demand in very close proximity to the point of consumption. And when you close that gap between the point of generation and point of consumption, it significantly reduces the price for that electricity. And so these are the price pressures, the economics driving this trend. 
And the trend is well underway. The revolution is well underway. And with the technological transition comes societal transformation. In the cities, it is certainly hard to think and consider and appreciate the value of electricity. I mean, I put it to you, given the choice, what would you rather? Kerosene or diesel for your car or electricity for your house? You can have electricity without economy, but you certainly can't have a modern economy without electricity. And electricity forms the cornerstone of modern society. But as mentioned, not everyone has access to electricity. Existing service delivery models have failed those in the world that live in too small of a town that's too far away from a large generator. Because in that situation, there's no business case to connect that town using millions of dollars of infrastructure. They'll never pay it back. So that town exists without electricity. But the way to provide that is actually using distributed renewable generation and distributed storage. So in the example of a remote village, a lot of those people actually have access to mobile phones. We're actually seeing digital payments uh, in, in those countries uh, largely occurring through mobile phones, and people are actually going to a single house in the local town and connecting that phone and charging off a solar panel, and they pay a fee for that. And so that person with that solar panel, they're receiving an income for having that single unit on their rooftop. But what this does is it then provides the business case to get a second solar panel, maybe a third, maybe a fourth. You know, they might decide to offer a charging service at night and get a battery. And ultimately, the value is being kept in that village, in that town, with that household. It's no longer flowing out to an external organisation or retailer. And in this example, the neighbour does the same thing, and her neighbour and his neighbour and so on and so forth. And the whole town, very simply and very easily and very affordably, can very quickly become a microgrid. Not only can these community members then fund a distribution network to interconnect the houses. But then as a town, they may decide to fund a transmission line to get that energy to the next town to trade with them. All of this is happening today. It's happening right through Africa, and it's technically possible. And it's a grassroots participatory process that's driving this revolution, completely transforming the lives of those individuals. So how is this possible? Well, in years of late, We've seen battery and solar technology specifically hit grid parity with network energy cost. What this means is when you're sitting at home consuming electricity from the network, it's about time for you to be able to afford a battery and solar system because you can use the money you're spending for energy anyway to vibe a system like this to provide your own electricity behind the meter. And this represents a significant issue in the traditional centralised network model. What happens when everyone disconnects? Is that likely to be the case? It's certainly more affordable. But energy markets have two things at a fundamental level. They have dollars and they have electrons. So far I've covered off on the electrons and I've spoken a bit about the dollars. But what that means is that the networks themselves are what's called a cyber physical system. So we have units of value flowing through a network, but payment has to be settled for that transmission of value. And so what we do is we use a technology that's actually been around since the early 1990s, made famous uh, only in the last uh, uh, five or six years, uh, called blockchain. What that thing allows you to do is it allows you to digitally send value. And that kind of sounds fundamentally boring, but everyone in this room here, we're already quite comfortable with digitally sending value. But what you don't see is that you can't actually do that without a middleman or an intermediary facilitating that transaction. You can't do that without your bank. Because when you send that $10, you're actually sending a signal to the bank, the bank sends a signal to your friend's bank, and then that money appears in their account. What blockchain facilitates is the digital transmission of value without a centralised intermediary. And so what we do is we have a software that we download into the market without any additional hardware to liberate and empower anybody connected to that network to sell electricity through the market to their neighbours. And what this does is it keeps electricity local, it keeps the prices down, and it keeps it decarbonised. This may sound highly innovative, and it definitely is on the cutting edge. We don't like to think we're on the bleeding edge. But the reason this model works is because what we do is have the customer at the centre of the platform. This concept is actually not too dissimilar to what we've seen with Airbnb and with Uber. This is where an organisation has 
basically allowed external ownership of assets and then to have business conducted on the platform. And the energy market, up until now, the network operators and governments will tell you it's the network that constrains what is physically possible, but I fundamentally deny that. Actually, innovation determines what is possible. And just like we saw with the telephone networks start to evolve and to become data service providers, internet service providers, to stop counting units moving through that network and to start focusing on managing capacity, we're seeing a similar transition underway in the electricity market. What we can do is we can reimagine those poles and wires on the street, not as a centralised service that has you hooked and connected for life to be consuming electricity from a long distance away. We can actually reclaim those poles and wires and turn them into a transactive layer, turn them into a trading platform where you can put on solar and battery and the software can take care of the rest. So when you're not at home consuming electricity, that energy is moving into the market, being consumed locally, the network operator is getting paid for that service, for the use of just that particular area of the network, and you receive a greater amount for your surplus electricity than what you would if you sold it to government. There is no subsidy needed for this. There is a cost of inaction. The solution is available today. These technologies are available today. However, existing incumbents, they have three choices. They can either fight the change, they can flight, they can leave the market, or they can innovate. The do-nothing case, the perpetuation of centralised generation in our network, can lead to mass defection. Because if it's cheaper to have battery and solar, you're going to leave. And for those that can't afford battery and solar, what's going to happen is, for the people that leave, it'll push up the prices for those that stay. And that'll push off the next tranche and the next tranche. Policymakers, we call this the energy death spiral. This is a system that's easily, easily improved. All you have to do is put a software into that existing infrastructure and you can save the network. In Western Australia's case, in Fremantle's case, it would be a horrible tragedy to completely disconnect from the network. The reason for that is because as taxpayers, we own this network. The estimated rebuild figure for our network is $15 billion. It's actually the largest machine in our civilization here in Western Australia. And it is ours. It is ours to use as we would want to use it. So what have we done about it? Well, we've deployed a series of global projects uh, utilizing software, converting energy markets into energy internet. Although we started very much here in Fremantle, we have projects now covering Japan, areas of India. We're trading energy over Bangkok megacity with the municipal utility, large-scale renewable generators, and with full government backing and support. But you know what? A win on the international ground is nothing compared to a win on the home ground. And so what we're doing in the city of Fremantle, we already have the first uh, tranche of prosumers producers and consumers transacting energy through the regulated market, working with the network operator and with the retailer. Today, at the moment, the amount of energy used is small, but this is the first step to realising energy internet here. But we're not the only company in this space, and the point of this is that what we have here is an ecosystem around digital disruption. What we have here is energy networks around the world taking the first steps that telecommunication networks took about 10 or 15 years ago. In fact, I put it to you that the future of interacting with your energy network is probably something that we can't quite imagine just yet. So to begin this process, I ask you to reimagine the energy internet. As people living on this planet, we have the power to change. We have the power to change a big machine that chooses what energy we use. We can join that revolution and we can change that machine by participating in any way we can. But the revolution started here in Fremantle and it's rolling out across the world. So thank you for your time tonight.